ongi etorri gutun zuria Bilbo Colet. Good afternoon and welcome. This is the International Literature Festival from Bilbao. Today we've got a very special evening because amongst other people we've got with us
we've got four women to talk to us about how essay and fiction come together, how they overlap. These are women who are great writers, and today this festival is going to take us beyond literature. Katisa Arebe is a writer who knows only too well how to link essays and fiction. Elisa de la Cruz, in her most recent work, has opened new avenues, and in addition to identification processes, she's included the protagonism of feminism. Eider Rodriguez is interested in bodies and creation, and Isaiah Barcenilia, who's a art curator, is a lecturer at the University of the Basque Country, and she knows that you have to walk your own road when you are writing, and that road never ends until the reader picks up your book. So she's, they're all going to be talking about the crossroads between essays and fiction. Arratxaldion denoi, mila mila esker retortzeagatik, mila esker baitare azkuna zentroari eta gutuntzuri. Thank you so much for coming. I should also like to thank the Azkuna Center and Gutun Surya for having offered us this opportunity to be here. This was going to be organized, this event, last year, but because of the uh, COVID pandemic, it had to be cancelled. And it's a real pressure that this year we're able to carry on with what was going to be organized last year. It had to be delayed, but we're carrying on this year. As I said in my introduction, I have got three guests, three exceptional guests. All three have hold PhDs, are related to the world of research and the world of audiovisuals. They all lecture as well, but above all, they are three writers, and because they are three writers, they're here to talk about their work, their books. They've all published different styles of literature, and so today we're going to be talking about and reflect on the limits that exist between essays and fiction, and without any specific goal in mind. All three of them have moved in different uh, avenues, and I'm going to summarize their professional host. Isa has spoken, has written about um, music. She's also written essays, and she's got a more recent work, which is difficult to uh, define and pigeonhole. It was uh, awarded the novel, prize for novel. And then we've got Eider, who's written different uh, uh, stories. And she's also worked in other genres. She's translated as well, literary essays. and also a comic. And uh, Katisha also works in a different field. She's work in she worked on children's books. And so as not to go on uh, to most recent works are novels. And Today she's going to talk about her most recent novel. I'm going to start with a question for all three of you, and then we'll go th th about things in a far more disorganized fashion. But first of all, I'd like to know from each of you if actually just being uh, a writer 
is also an essay. I mean, is there an essay about, do you become an essay as you are a writer? Good afternoon, thank you. Thank you, Aisea, for this introduction. And thanks to all of you who have decided to attend this event on a Friday afternoon. Is it a test or a trial? Is it testing to be a writer? Well, you'll have to clarify what you mean by a, a test or a, is it a trialing trial? Yes, anything that you trial, any essay is a, a creative process. You can plan what you want to do. You can take notes. And this is something that I do on many occasions because I'm very hard working. You can think a lot. But at the end of the day... It's, you're always exploring. You're out there exploring. Of course, you always come across surprises on the way. You're always out there venturing forth. There'll be unexpected things in your path. There'll be failure. There'll be things that go wrong. But this is a process that is always ongoing. You'll never get to a point where everything goes right and you don't fail. That would be just... If you thought that, you'd be in a situation of false hope. And so we need to learn that all of this is a process. And what we uh, learn from that, we then apply it again. We can fail again. But we all progress. We progress along the road, the creative road. Maybe I should concentrate now on the idea... When I Even when I wasn't writing essays is a little bit when I like when I wrote my PhD. I'm like those authors that don't just like sitting down and having everything planned out ahead of them. It's like Lorenzo Stern. And he said, I progress as I digress. You sort of progress as you skip from one idea to the next. So for me writing has always been a, a question of sitting down and writing to discover. You don't already know what you're going to write and you express w what you think about at that moment. I'm also very obsessive about the issues that I want to deal with in my novels. I always try to get as much documentation as possible when I write. And even though I didn't start experimenting with uh, hybrid forms until only recently. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. Hello, Isaiah. As my colleagues have already responded, I don't actually have a great deal to add. I like the way that there's a... a parallelism between essay and fiction and the idea that essay in Spanish and say also means a trial, trial and error because that's how I f feel of my, about myself uh, every time you sit down you feel uh, weaker I'd say it's, it's a very precarious state to be in uh, and, and almost much closer to this idea of a, a trial so my reply to your question is yes Isa, maybe I could now directly ask you, uh, related to the book that you wrote called Changing Ideas. When I read that book, I thought it was an essay or an experiment, maybe. It was almost like I was watching an experiment when I read it. And then you were awarded the, not the prize for novel, and I thought... How interesting is that? I didn't understand it as a novel. Actually, when I wrote, I thought, yeah, maybe it's a hybrid thing, but I thought it was closer to an essay. So I'd just like to know you. I mean, what's you, did you have an idea in mind? Did you want to have a different format? Or did, the, did, did as you wrote, did, was it, were you taken down a new avenue? I don't know. What genre this book actually appears to changing ideas? Maybe, maybe I should have uh, put it in the essay award. Then I could have got two prizes for it. But at the end of the day, when I conceived it, I conceived it as an essay, and I also thought of the kind of essay that I would like to have always read, especially those that have been in the academic 
world. I don't like the idea of traditional academic essays as if there's some kind of a neutral a voice of the author that, that puts out their ideas to the world because the author of a traditional essay n never shows themselves. It's like they don't have any sort of emotional involvement or bias. It's almost like God uh, was uh, testing their... And I think that's always what been what's limited, limiting for essays. It's almost like the author tends to disappear because they're trying to get scientific purity. I, I like, for example, what San Agustin does. You say, OK, I'm going to do an essay, but first of all, I'm going to going to explain, first of all, why this obsession exists. Whenever you sit down to write a project which is full of ideas, you think, am I going to spend two years writing about this because it's important for me, because this is something that I want to lay claim to it. But returning to your question, what I tried to do with this book was do make an essay, but not hide things at essays or that authors always do, i.e. explaining who you are, where you come from, what your position on something is, I putting the context to your essay at the outset. I liked the book that you wrote. When I was reading it, I saw that there were contrasts that you were seeking and counter-arguments. And then you mentioned that in your text as well, that you don't want to get across one truth. You don't want to get across this idea that you're right. You know, you want to take a different path. And I was thinking, Katisa, the text that you wrote that, that has been published this year, I can't actually remember the title of it now. Uh, the essay starts here. Yes, that's, that's what it's called. This, the text that was written for this, you s spoke about fiction in the end. And you said that fiction and essay are ways of telling a tale. Both of them are ways of telling a tale. Yes. Yes, I started that with an anecdote because a reader came to me, a fan of mine, a gentleman, and he, sa he said to me, and he was talking about the two novels that I'd written. He said that after having read both novels, he noted that I was tending more increasingly to an essay, that you could see that in my first novel and more so in the second. And the question that I was wondering and that he asked was whether the third would be a pure essay and whether that was my true intention. I don't know why. Maybe I hadn't reached that ultimate goal. And that question was just hanging in there, floating in there, and I thought, well, maybe that, that, that's the way it is. No, and then I thought, no, 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 actually, that's not true. After having thought about it, my conclusion was that I have something, but not only me. I think that all of us who write always have fiction floating around. We can't, we can't tell tales that are completely outside of fiction. Every time we're going to tell something, we're going to recount something, we drink from the source of fiction. We use the resources of fiction. If I had to, to you to tell you what I was doing last night. I couldn't tell you how it actually happened. That wouldn't be possible. So what I'll do, it, what I'll do is I'll choose important events because I know how the uh, evening ends. So this uh, uh, final gives a logic to everything else. I choose the characters. I choose the way to connect them together to tell uh, what happened last night. And I can say that it's true, but I'm, I'm using fiction actually. And when we write, I think, more or less, when we approach or, or move away from reality, we're always using these tools of fiction. That's what, that's what I claim, anyway. That's my conclusion. The conclusion that I've reached when I was asked that question by that gentleman. And what about your case, Ada? You've got two books that are... That are 
essays. They're pure essays. They're not hybrid formats. You intended them to be essays, and both of them uh, come from your research. They're linked to your research. So what's the role of fiction in these essays, even though they're not fictional? It may well be that in the bodies of, of these of these works, you've got your presence as well. So, because you've got interviewees there, and, and the reasons you interview your interviewees says something about you. But what I, what I think they do is they tell you something about you. Maybe this is a traditional essay in, in its format, but how do you locate yourself there? What's for you the relationship between essay and fiction? I've written two essays, one was Images Over the Sea by Yoseva Sarayndia. It's taken from my doctoral thesis, a, a traditional structure, but a traditional structure because of the, the situation at the time. But in my other work, my second work isn't so traditional because as Aisha quite rightly said, I explain who I am, what my starting point is as a writer, why I want to write, what I'm concerned about, what my interests are, etc. Et so I place my knowledge. So any essay that you want to write, the starting point has to be there, so th that you loyal you have to do that so that you're loyal and so that precisely your your testing your feeling your searching for something but what what's your starting point that's what you have to explain where where did you start what's your baggage why are you seeking that certain something and not something else and as we said earlier we're used to an objective truth and a neutral methodology and the use of these tools. And after spending time at the university in academia, when you take your, uh, when you reveal something, you see there is no, nothing is objective. The same goes for uh, lab tests. There are human, subjective decisions that think of certain uh, bodies and that have been uh, formed, shaped in a certain way. And when you spoke about fiction, you've got those tools. The, these are tools to tell tales which writers use you need to have uh, a central knot, you need a conclusion, and all theses require that. Any essay uh, requires that. Maybe I would highlight the following. I wouldn't put the essay in what is real and what is contrary to reality, but fiction is also a tool to try to find truth. And in fact, you, you are no closer to truth in an essay than you are when you write fiction. Maybe I'm not using the term correctly here. On many occasions, we use reality and truth. And I think that also in fiction, you can, you, you can of course, fight for that. Yes, of course, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand that, that there's this trend amongst uh, readers, amongst some readers, to read essay to learn that's what they say they're doing especially amongst men uh, sorry apologize for that but that that's my my own personal digression they want to make use of their time to to learn something but i think it's a very way poor way of looking at things don't you learn uh, via fiction fiction which uh, uh, a, which represent universal human experiences, even if they're not real. They're still representing universal uh, human experiences. Yes, I'm going to relate everything because it it's, um, follows on 
from another question. I said earlier that you, three of you, have got PhD. You've all had to write a doctoral thesis, and and that requires writing, but not perhaps the same kind of writing. I think it's interesting what you were saying there, that when you've spent some time in university, you sort of unmask yourself. But in your case, how do you relate a character that's uh, appropriate for academic life and, and for other uh, forms of writing that are different? Or do you not feel comfortable in both forms, but you face both sides? Well, briefly, I don't feel comfortable when I uh, write academic texts. I, I, I get um, tense, the requirements that are there, the, uh, it just, I just feel completely, I start drowning, I'm just completely overwhelmed. I feel more of a researcher when I'm writing literature. I know they say that, some people think that writing a literature isn't a, a research work, doesn't require research work, but for me it's really what you have to do. I'm a really bad academic, actually. I don't have any special talent as an academic, nor do I particularly want to be one, but if I've... I did do something, I know it wasn't difficult for me to write a PhD thesis. I know some people find it very difficult. But for me, it was easy to write my PhD thesis. And what came afterwards is actually precisely because I find writing easy. For me, shaping what I've got in my mind or what I've been researching is naturally not difficult. I, I already had acquired skills, and for me, what is that? What are those skills? Well, what you're writing even within the world of academia and restricted by a certain series of regulations, you can still seduce the other using the seduction tools that I mentioned earlier, that are, which are then used to explain to you what happened to me last night, especially to rate everything. This is something that I say to all my PhD students. Everything needs a thread to run through it from the beginning to the end. The reader needs to be given something so that he carries on reading. Many people don't know how to do that. You, you just do uh, things according to rules and regulations and you end up with a text which isn't very flexible and which is uninteresting, people don't want to read. But if you give it a structure, if you give it some thread, if you from time to time explain things from your viewpoint, from your situation, explaining where your interest comes from. Well, you know, a lecturer told me once, uh, and that's where my inspiration came from, dot, dot, dot. If you use that, you end up with a pretty decent text, even though what you're researching isn't so weighty. And in this sense, I'm really, really grateful for my writing experience because that's actually helped me um, advance in a different, from a different viewpoint. Katisa was my uh, thesis director, so you know, what can I say? And I've realized that I actually enjoyed the process of writing my thesis. I know there are regulations in the world of academia, but it's also very stimulating to write, despite the fact that there's a lot of regulations that are almost against this idea of you generating something new. I did enjoy the process, I have to say. And I decided to write a more literary essay because I was, to a certain extent, contaminated by the writing. There's something else that I don't like about the academic process. And um, please correct me if I'm wrong, because you're my professor here. Is that, in theory, 
you propose a thesis and then you have a research uh, project which has to confirm that thesis or refute it. But I'm, I, I, I just wonder whether when you correct so many PhD theses, uh, whether the initial hypothesis is not eventually confirmed in the final few paragraphs. Is there a sort of a confirmation bias? That, for me, is what I think goes against what I believe is real knowledge. And coming back to now to talk about my book again, it's something that I had in mind when I wrote Cambiar de Adea, or Changing Ideas. I, I was interested in the process that the theoreticians who we are reading, what's the process they go through when they write the text that we have, we're reading? Wouldn't it be stimulating to be able to access all the different changes in idea that we know that actually happen until you find the, um, uh, the hypothetic thesis that you're writing towards at the end? That's what I'd really like from academic work, that it'd be a little bit more humble, it'd be a little bit more aware of uh, the, all the different um, deviations that you uh, take before you get to your final destination. Another question, because I've got a, a very difficult question for you now. It's a little bit, and this is a, we're going to be talking about fiction and autobiography here, but we're also talking here about the subject of knowledge. On the one hand, you've got feminist literary criticism, which on many occasions has said to us, that in uh, books written by women, there's a certain trend to seek in the text some kind of a representation of the author, and it ends up being a, an autobiography. And w we've been told that that's because women are limited by that. They, they're limited uh, by their lack of imagination. They're limited by the ability only, the only ability they have, which is to tell their experiences. This is being researched. This is being looked into, how the, the figure of the author is built. And there are time and again that these dialogues, how, how we can go to the author. Uh, but on the other hand, at the same time, you get a uh, feminism that uh, says that private, what's private is political. We're people, we're bodies, and we can use that uh, to n uh, attain knowledge, and it shouldn't be discriminated against. Aisha, what do you think? You've written in first person, singular, in, in Katisha as well. You've but you've written in first person in one of your books. I know this isn't a very clear question, but you can and you can answer it from wherever you want. But where did you put the things that you know in these books? And to what extent have you avoided um, expressing your own knowledge for different reasons? Oh, that's a clear question. Yes, it is a clear question. Don't worry. On many occasions, it's something that I've thought about. In fact, before coming here, we were talking about reading groups, the type of experiences that we've had with uh, when we meet up, up with our readers. And this is something you see. People want to know. People want to know how much of your book is autobiographical and how much is not autobiographical. This is something that we're asked time and time again. This, this uh, interest from the public is out there. But I think it's just, you know, they want to find out. There's nothing else behind it. It's just, you know, and they say, oh, I've read this, it's a bit all shocking, and I've got the author here, and I want to know whether it's self Mm, it's autobiographical. It's just gossip at the end of the day. I, I actually don't attach any importance to it at all. But it is important, yes. And I usually deal with this and I say, as I said earlier, that everything is fiction. When I write, absolutely everything is fiction. Despite the fact that something is in first person or is based on my own experience. 
and that's to be able to include it in the thread of my book. I'll have had to uh, deal with it. I've had to come in contact with it. If I, and I don't, I'm not faithful to it. If I have to exaggerate, I'll, I'll exaggerate it. If I have to um, make it less important, that I have to. I'll um, do so, and it, but it has to fit into this narrative line. When I'm preparing a book, I would try to find consistency within the world of the book. I don't. I'm not faithful at all to my position when face, facing reality. So I completely free. I know that this is going to be fiction for me, and that nobody, nobody should feel offended at all. Sometimes I've had actually problems. Some others have said to me, how could you possibly write that? One of my friends said, you know, how did you write that? Goodness me. How could you possibly do that? And somebody actually asked me, have you been telling my secrets? And I just laugh. I haven't written a lot in first person, some a little bit, but there's something I wanted to say about your question. The, the contradiction that you, you, you mentioned. As you said, there's a tendency to say that, especially when it's a female writer, they're trying to equate themselves to what they write and try to write autobiographical data in information in their texts to be able to say that what they write is autobiographical. This is painful and then it is because these are statements that are actually made but people say that to hurt you but I'd also say it's quite normal because we're talking about a community that's been oppressed, historically oppressed. And writing is something that women have done throughout history, writing in first person, and we can't. Just turn away and forget that. We can't just look the other way. It's an interesting. We need to bear that in mind. When when or female authors are attacked or or depreciated this has happened to women this has happened to lesbians gays basques both men and women can we not do that as women i think that there's only very few uh, in our group aisha knows this better you know what it's like to write in first person. Maybe we don't know so much about that here. I also have this feeling that we didn't try to see whether testimonial books actually are more valuable or not. But that issue aside, I think it's a process issue. I think... Maybe writing fiction is a privilege of those who haven't been represented in the dominant model or the are underrepresented. So maybe the first uh, step is to bear witness and then um, fictionalize later on. So I think, yes, I don't agree that testimonial literature is an inferior genre and I think it's actually necessary to put those groups who historically have not had um, been able to make much noise historically they need to be given a voice and then you've got all these friends who ask you out of everything you've written how much is true you asked me what's my experience for me, it's, it frees my feelings. I love writing a book that's uh, by no means everything is true. Not everything that I write in my book is true, but this impact of writing fiction is very freeing initially. I found it frightening. 
I thought, oh, what's my mother going to think of this? Or the uh, lady that sells me the bread on the, in the corner shop. And yet you just leave that fear to one side. But then these creepy questions about how much uh, view is in the text. And then all of a sudden you can start a conversation about a book that goes beyond the idea of the fact that it's autobiographical. Katisha, and in your case, I imagine that in your book uh, entitled Mothers Know, this has probably happened to you on more than one occasion, uh, people have related it to your own maternity, or people have been concerned about your maternity. Yes, all sorts of things have happened. In fact, recently, and I say that in the essay, a woman, one of my readers, saw me out on the streets. And when she realised that I had a son and a daughter, and not just one daughter, uh, she almost got uh, angry and didn't, it was really strange. And people have taken this as if it was something real, something that really happened to me. But it's a novel. This happens, this is what happens afterwards if you write. So, I, I write completely free and with a mask. And this is something I really want to state. I, I, I can say that I built an alter ego and I give that alter ego all the freedom that she wants to take to the extreme, everything that they want to see. It's not something that I would say or do, but I allow this character to say whatever they want to say, whatever comes to, their, whatever comes to mind. It's a way of uh, finding a road to freedom. And as for maternity, in one of your texts, you said the following. You said that when you were, became mother, when you gave birth, that was like a weight. That was a terrible, like a, a millstone around your neck because it came up time and time again in the text that you wrote. And you thought that it would harm your work. And you also spoke about uh, how you wrote your thesis. And you said that different types of maternity are affected in literature and the majority of them are evil mothers or mothers that uh, regret having be become mothers or that have difficult relations with their children uh, or different kinds of uh, motherhoods as it were and this made you uh, question whether it was possible to not become a mother so that people could uh, move away from a reader. Yes, I, I, that's true. I was really concerned when I gave birth. I, I, well, I wondered whether I would be able to carry on writing. And then there was a more symbolic uh, concern, which is if I manage it, will what I write be credible? Or will it smell like baby food, what I'm writing? I really had that in the back of my mind. Can you imagine in the past? I was sort of in a fog and, and Argia actually interviewed me and I agree. We were asked if we could write without agenda. I had a time and when I thought that, that it was possible and yet Once I was pregnant, it was impossible. I, I realised that before. In the past, I could be a woman and a writer. I a writer and a woman. But when things, when I became a mother, another word was added. That's woman, writer and mother. And both women and mother just move you away from that. This came up in many, many occasions. And in interviews, I, I was asked, I can remember an interview when I was asked, you know, are you writing anything? Are you going to publish a book? And I thought, oh, you know, you'll probably be very busy because you've got children and you're not going to be able to write. So it may well be 
nowadays these comments I wouldn't have wouldn't have bothered me but at the time I find that really hard I found that really hard and from that time onwards I decided that I wanted to see what happened to writers once they became mother sorry I'm going on to for a lot but you can't leave your body even if you want to leave your body it is there everything is you are part of the text despite the fact that I never uh, give a, a press conference I always be uh, maybe an evil writer I studied this in my thesis it was in an examination of uh, uh, novels uh, to the year whatever and 80% of these novels spoke about uh, motherhood and 80% of them were negative about them they took a negative view of motherhood They're, these are characters that abandoned their children I'm just wondering if this is something you have to pay this is the price you have to pay that a, a writer appears as a, a reaction as a woman who is a given a series of attributes and this means that we have less freedom to write I wanted to write that I wanted to ask that of a series of writers men and women I don't know if in your case whether motherhood has has made you be curious about these issues or about other issues you've got a book about mothers and it uh, and is this concern this curiosity something that you think about or do you, or did you just want to think about it and then write fiction yes it is a concern it's a concern of all female writers we've all come up against the same wall and we've all had to think in that way maybe initially we turned our backs to the problem but then we've eventually had to face it I think it's a fairly normal process that I've listened I've heard many female writers say many times we say oh I'm gonna write but I don't want anybody to notice that I'm a woman we sort of escape ourselves but in the end we end up embracing our feminine side. Uh, I, I have my feminine side, I have other sides as well, but the, my feminine side has its uh, weight. So in the end, we can embrace this uh, part, which has its weight and it's related to motherhood. And we look more closely at this issue. And we know that for many uh, people, this is something that... Uh, They don't like they, they find that it, like a second rate or a third rate subject and that they really aren't concerned about pregnancy i think motherhood gives us all opens up a whole series of ambivalences and contradictions the thing that I find most difficulty difficult since I've been a mother is that people think that there's some kind of incompatibility between what we do as a mother and what we do as a writer and it's a conflict that's out there and I always feel the divide I am always with my daughter and, it's, and sometimes I get cross I enjoy be, spending time with her but sometimes I feel guilty because I can't be with my daughter because actually although I want to be with her I'd rather be writing so you've got this ambivalent situation that happens when you're a mother did you see the screenshot that I sent you the other day I'm just trying to remember the other day I think it's a letter by Elena Fortuna, uh, Carmen Laforet. Carmen Laforet 
says that she says that she's never going to be able to write again it was going to be impossible with five children it must have been impossible with five children i find that interesting because elena fortuna replied with something along the lines of the well firstly she said the typical cliche she said that oh no really no artist should get involved in what is private and then it says in enjoy enjoy this life that actually hasn't actually made for you i know it's a typical cliche but at the end of the day it forces you to see this contradiction as a sort of a uh, fantastic experience and that okay this wasn't for me but i'm but i'm doing it i can do both things so you didn't actually look at my screenshot but i loved it it's what we always say, but always seen from a, a new way of things. Like this uh, soul wasn't for this body, but there it is. I think with that, I can open up a Q&A session from, for any questions that the audience may have or comments as well. The time is now yours. Yeah. <laughs> now that I can see you, I feel like saying hello. Nobody's courageous enough to ask a question? Look, somebody, somebody has plucked up the courage. Yes, it would seem there is a question from the audience. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this talk. When do essays become essays? And how do you finish off a well-written essay? How would you define that? Katisha, off you go. Do I have to reply? What's a good essay? That's the question, is it? Or when does it? When does a good essay start? Is that the question? Well, I've already made my opinion clear about the fact that there's no such thing as a pure essay. There's always going to be an element of fiction. So, what is a good essay? Well, that makes you, it's something that makes you think, that opens doors for you, even though you may not be able to go anywhere. And think maybe that's the problem of the academic world in that you need conclusions you need strict conclusions one two three one one a one b and everything ends up in a sort of um, uh, list of points i think in a good essay you can't do that and i think you can still open new doors in an essay we've opened new doors we've gone through uh, new rooms but in the end there'll always be new doors that you can carry on opening and it's also interesting that there are people that read essays about things that they already know. Yes, there's people that do that. Yes, as you said, at the end, this is to provoke dialogue. This is uh, something that forces you to adopt a different pos position but if you're so clear on what you think, why would you bother writing about it? Why, why do you read if it's something you already know? I don't know if we've replied to your question. Any further questions? Whilst people are plucking up courage, I'll ask you another question. Have you ever had the experience that uh, research has opened a sort of a crack to fiction, i.e. you're in an academic world, and, world and, but that uh, moves you on to another door which opens up to different kinds of uh, literature but based on the initial research. Are they completely separate worlds and fiction uh, can join the other worlds but not the other way around? I don't know if it happens to you but for me writing a novel or an essay 
is an end of going thoroughly into a subject. You finish it off. Like, by the time you finish, there's nothing less. There's, there's nothing left. For me, it's a way of putting a final full stop to certain issues that are open from time to time. So I usually end up a closing a part of my life when I finish a novel, when I get to the, re the right to the end of it. Maybe I haven't... It hasn't um, led me on to do anything else, but actually some issues have come up that I've then later used in fictional works or uh, things related to people that attend congresses, the things that you experience, the characters, but it's all interrelated because these are people who research. And when, you when I coincide with these people, well... There are all sorts of characters there. Con congresses, congresses and weddings can you can write a lot of fiction about them. If you want to write a story, there's no bad stories if you talk if it's about a about a wedding. Any further questions? If there are no comments or questions, I don't know if you want to add anything more. Yes, go on. Yes, please do. I was saying that maybe we it's time to do a test. Let's try to uh, prepare a, a story from this event and we'll read it in next year's event. Well, that's an open-ended proposal. It's, this is something that wrote that Katisha wrote. I think it talks about fiction, a crossroads of fiction. There's a question from the audience, I've been told. I've heard Katisha spoke, speak about essays and men. And I think it's the way, uh, it's the way that men read essays and women don't, as if essays are the more highbrow parts of literature, the, the uh, higher, le higher kind of literature. And now essays are becoming fashionable again. People talk about essays and essays seem to be higher up the ranking. Uh, than they used to be. Can you tell me what you think about men essays, women novels, which seems to be the historical relationship? And why do you think at the current time essays are now becoming so popular, far more than they used to be in the past? I think that people are going through such a strange time, a strange era, that people need uh, a feeling of safety, objectiveness, dogma. And maybe it's related, the, the popularity of essays uh, is related to that. It's something that it's been building up for a time now, but over the last year, perhaps more so, there's this thirst for essays. As for the relationship between essays go with men and novels go with women, this is what we've been talking about, I think. Essays in the end and the methodology that's followed is so heteropatriarchal. It was invented in that way. It uh, emerged in that way and it's fully consistent. Uh, it makes sense that it's ended up that and because novels were born to entertain. There's a complete uh, difference between what uh, women were supposed to write and men are supposed to write. When women started openly writing, which didn't really happen until the 19th century, it's understood that women are allowed to write maybe mm, romantic novels uh, in which um, their lover suffers or whatever, or maybe they're allowed to be uh, write verses. 
but a, a woman writing a political treaty would be a scandal. And that's what happened in the past. And it's only 200 years that have gone by since then. And I think we're still mm, carrying those synergies with us, mm, synergies of what men should write and what women's genres should be. Even though a, a great deal of um, time has passed in that, that's our background. I was thinking actually, when we were talking about Twitter early, it's true that essays are something that have become more popular in the last five to ten years. Is this because social media have opened mm, public debate to the masses? We're living in an era in which in the past uh, people didn't have a debating forum and now everybody can uh, do so. It's like the pressure that it is exerted by mm, social media of always expressing your opinion, always having an opinion about something. Okay, yes, I'm now going to read. Base, we're just trying to explain here and detail agility to explain what's happening to others. That's it. It's what Katisha was saying. I think we can leave it there, not specify anything and think that this is actually what essay is all about. Thank you so much for attending. See you again soon. Eskerrik asko, espero dugu saioa zeuen gustokoa izatea. Saio honen ondoren, egileak liburuak zeinatzen alituko dira liburu den dazen, askuna zentroko liburu den dan. Irteera modu seguru eta ordenatuan egiteko, Egon zeuen eserlekuetan, eta bete itzazue aretoko langileen jarraibideak, amaierako lerroetatik hasi, eta segurtasun distantzia utziz. Eskerrik